So as I think you know, uh, today, again, we're gonna have just an informal um, optional discussion. You've all come, so I guess you've ex exercised your option, but um, we're gonna be talking today in 8225-SJS042 uh, about some of the themes raised by uh, that second documentary film that, that hopefully you had a chance to watch, uh, the film called Containment, a film made by uh, Peter Gallison and, and Rob Moss and, and, their, and their team, their whole team. Um, and like last time, like, like our discussion of after the film, The Day After Trinity, um, sort of the floor is open. So I'm just curious, um, you know, what, what people make of it. Let me, let me ask a more specific question. Was there anything in the film that surprised you that you really didn't expect, uh, or that you hadn't seen, or you, you knew something about, but this, this, you know, uh, looked at it from a different angle or something like that? You might know, it might not have been so clear. It might have, I can't remember. You know, the, uh, Peter and, and Rob, the filmmakers, were working on this project um, before the Fukushima uh, earthquake and, and reactor uh, meltdown. They were already immersed in this project and they were already actively filming. And then uh, the earthquake in March, 2011 occurred. So in some sense that the film took a turn uh, while they were already kind of immersed in it. I don't know if, if considering how, how squarely the film kind of begins and ends, with a lot of material about very fairly recent developments in Japan, I was just curious uh, if that if that shows in your viewing. Because the film originally, of course, I didn't know that was coming. They were starting the film, they were working on the film before that even had occurred. Did that? Did the film hold together? Did that seem like it was tacked on? I'm just curious, you know, what what people make of of this body of material. Let, thank you, Alex. I, let, let's sit with that for a few. So I, they were, Peter and Rob already were quite interested in, in uh, areas that do show up a lot of the film, like the um, kind of waste storage facilities uh, in the continent of the United States. And as many of you might know, there have been long, 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 saying decades long debates just within the US context about how, where, whether to, to develop a, a domestic storage facility. Well, should it be at uh, Yucca Mountain? Should it be some other site? The, the so-called WIT facility was already then well under. My apologies, my, my, the power went out in my house temporarily. So I, and here I am, it's clearly just a little blip. Anyway, sorry about that. Um, so um, I have to say, I, I, I might be repeating things that, that I missed when, when I was offline for a moment. One of the parts of the film that I do find most fascinating are these efforts to get a range of types of specialists to design some, corner, some kind of symbol system or communication system that could plausibly and reliably be legible, you know, be readable to people hundreds of thousands of years in the future. Um, whether it's, you know, archeologists and linguists or other kinds of anthropologists or experts in SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or, you know, sculptors or all, all these kinds of range of people to say, how do we make something that can be that will tell people still, still, still don't dig here because some of these uh, highly uh, poisonous to humans, at least highly poisonous radioactive isotopes have half lives in the tens of thousands, uh, multiple tens of thousands of years. And so if you need activity levels to fall by many half lives worth, you're looking at you know, 300,000 year time horizons into the future. And you think about, you know, we've had the printing press since um, you know, approximately 1450 plus or minus or 1350 anyway, you know, we can measure that expanse in a couple thousand years, not a couple tens of thousands of years. You know, the kind of Latinate alphabet uh, dates to again on the order of maybe I don't know 5,000 years, something like that. It's, these these are these are a drop in the bucket time scale wise compared to a 300,000 year projection into the future. And I found that part of the, of the film really um, just fascinating. How it just as a, as a you know, it's, it's, I think in part of the interview that was also on the readings for, for today, an interview that Peter Gallison had done while he was working on the film. It, it's sort of part science fiction. It's an interesting thought experiment just to imagine a, a kind of communicative system for our uh, vastly future selves. Um, so it's partly science fiction and also like really deadly serious. Like this stuff will still be harmful to humans and even you know, human-like creatures uh, plausibly in you know, uh, N generations forward. 
So anyway, I found that part of the film. That's something I didn't know much about before learning about it from Peter and, and, and he's working on the film. That really st stuck with me quite, uh, quite hauntingly. Any other thoughts on, on, the, on the material? It doesn't have to be limited to the film, other things we talked about in class recently as well. It's totally fair game as well. He has uh, worked with a number of um, students and colleagues who've, who've thought very hard about SETI as, um, as a, from an astronomical point of view, but also as historians or anthropologists of science studying these communities in present day. And you know, it, it does feel like it, that work is often a kind of projection of our assumptions about ourselves. What will the others look like? Well, we have a, a range of experience to base that on, which is what we know about. Um, and, and so it does have a similar kind of um, ambition and yet maybe limitation from, from, our, from just the horizon of our own imaginations. Uh, and so I think it's it struck me as totally appropriate once I learned of it from, from say Peter and Rob's film that these Department of Energy experts would call on SETI experts because the, the, the nature of the intellectual challenge does seem quite similar. And at the same time, it also feels you know, exactly as well, as big a, ch a remaining challenge as it is for anything else, because the, the SETI folks have, you know, ha are also dealing with what, what they know about, what they've experienced, what they can even imagine, the horizons even of their imaginations. So in that sense, it does feel like a remarkably similar uh, exercise. There's also, we, I mean, I wrote a little piece about this some years ago. <clears throat> as many of you might know, is a bit of an aside, but SETI, uh, a large part of the SETI work has focused on something called the Drake Equation, named for astronomer Frank Drake back in 1961. And there was an effort to try to <clears throat> quantify and estimate, admittedly very loose estimates, how likely a signal might actually be expected to be from, say, a, an intelligent extraterrestrial civilization. And the last term in this equation is always the kind of expected lifetime of the civilization that would have been sending the putative signals. And in the Cold War, in exactly the period we have our heads in the middle of in, in this class, <clears throat> that last term of the Drake equation, capital L, always was a stand-in for, to those thinking about it at the time, for all-out nuclear holocaust. So it wasn't that there was a kind of biological you know, um, uh, lifespan, they thought it was really, did, did, the, did the civilization blow itself to bits the way it seemed to many people at the time that maybe people on earth were about to do or poised to do. So there's, there's a, actually a high kind of nuclear component even to SETI as well. The, the, the community had already been thinking about a kind of knife edge of survival in a nuclear age, is what they consider to be a knife edge. Uh, and on, at the same time, there've been all these kind of technological spin-offs uh, for certain kinds of multi-channel analyzers and other technological kind of um, uh, fancy electronics and code that was developed first for SETI. How do you sift through millions of channels at once, millions of frequency bands say. And those, some of those were brought back, so to speak behind the fence into certain kinds of very sophisticated nuclear testing, especially after the ban on, on actual test blasts and this era of what, what's now called um, stockpile stewardship. So SETI seems like it's always about the far away, the distant, the literally extra galactic or, or, or certainly extraterrestrial. And yet it's, it's, its own history has been kind of grounded and intertwined with, with a kind of Cold War nuclear um, age from, from its own beginning. So maybe all the more appropriate then that some SETI experts as well as linguists and, and, and philosophers and sculptors would be, would be working with the Department of Energy to think about symbol systems for 300,000 years hence. Were there parts of the <clears throat> the the WIP facility? Uh, what was it called? Was it? I can't remember what WIP stands for. Waste injection pilot project, something like that. That's a great question, Alex. I, <clears throat> I don't remember the specifics. Thank you for asking it. So I think in general it's smaller. I think the ideas for Yucca Mountain um, <clears throat> were were ultimately much. Um, more grand, it would have had a much higher storage capacity, for example, well, at least it never got past kind of design specs, but that was the, the ambition for Yucca Mountain was it really was supposed to be like a one-stop shop and we've solved it, like that's it. 
we have enough capacity sort of for the indefinite future. And I don't think anyone at WIP ever thought that. I think WIP was always seen as um, a kind of proof of principle center and Alona uh, helpfully reminds us what WIP stands for. Thank you, Alona. Waste Isolation Pilot Plant. Okay, good, thank you. So WIP, WIP was, an, in, I think was, was built to be as, as his name uh, even implies, a kind of pilot project for something that could potentially later be scaled up. And then as it turns out there, you know, um, some real uh, technical challenges, even with the pilot design is, that's why I build pilots. I guess you find out what, what might not work the way you think it would just from the engineering specs. But I think in general, the plans for Yucca Mountain were, were to be um, like forever, like we've solved it. It was, was the ambition of the hope. That it would be the one place with enough capacity with uh, presumed geological stability that could, be, that could be estimated again in the hundreds of thousands of years time frame. I don't know how one could ever have that confidence, but that was at least something people were thinking about. Uh, and that it would be the, the one site needed uh, at least for the domestic United, you know, uh, continental United States, maybe even for, for worldwide. And I think that you know, certainly has, has not yet come to be, to put it mildly. So there's, there's a, I think, really interesting footage in the film about some of the local kind of town hall meetings in and around where the WIP facility, I think, was ultimately made. Uh, where you can see, you know, there, there's, a, there's a robust range of, of opinions. Is it good for the local economy in the short term? Does it make good, you know, secure, well-paying jobs? Um, you know, does it improve the kind of local tax base, those kinds of arguments? Uh, and uh, other concerns that are raised about, uh, is, that, is that a worthwhile trade-off? And that's just for, again, this kind of pilot facility in one kind of, um, in one area. Um, it, it is a, a fascinating question if you get to kind of participatory democracy for the here and now is already really hard, as I think, again, we're kind of getting reminded of every day. Now imagine this when you're trying to make decisions, I think, as you're saying, they'll have implications for generations to, you know, to come. Um, what, what's the, who has say for, on behalf of them? How do you even incorporate that? Let alone the, 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 the sort of next five year or 10 year plan, will this be um, better or worse for the, for the local community? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and again, there's something much like with Fukushima, obviously the filmmakers were, were immersed in the project long before that had occurred. So the film was itself a kind of moving, not a moving target, but the film evolved more over the course of its making than I think films otherwise often do. And that's again, it was, a, it was a genuine surprise, surprise to filmmakers, surprise, of course, to the, many of the operators and the locals. Um, and again, one could say, well, that's why you do small scale engineering pilot projects. You wanna learn from these and hopefully, you know, get better and better and maybe it'll scale, but it does, it, it raises some extraordinarily difficult questions if, if as you say, on a, on a kind of decade long time scale, let alone, you know, 10 to, 10 to the power, 10 to the one years, as opposed to you know, 10 to the five years, that's a, that's a big change. Uh, can we can we get ten to the one years done, or even a century, let alone uh, uh, you know a hundred thousand years? So yeah, I was surprised by that too. I, um, yeah. What about some of the scenes? This is, this was some of this was new for me as well. Some of the sort of scenes within kind of active reactors, just this, just the scenes of the kind of machinery of, of what it's like for humans to be interacting with these, with these very hot materials, hot in many ways. Um, you know, I don't think I'd ever seen moving picture of that uh, before myself, before seeing the film. Just even in a, in, a, in a reactor site that's operating, you know, perfectly appropriately, perfectly canonically, just, you know, how do you deal with these, with these sort of spent fuel rods and all these kinds of things. Just getting a visual of that and the scale of it, um, what it's like with all the benefits of our own kind of present day high technology, let alone when people were doing this, you know, back in the forties and fifties. I found that really um, actually pretty riveting too, just, just sort of visually, viscerally. What, what's it like to be working in a site like that? When things are going right, when things are going perfectly as, as the engineers, you know, and scientists had, had, had hoped. I don't know, Alex, it's a great question. I'm not, I don't know if anyone else on, on, on the conversation knows about that. Not, I bet we could find out with some quick Googling, but I don't know offhand. Um, yeah. You know, as, again, as you, as you may know, there was a time in the, starting in the late 1940s, the early years after the Second World War, and really accelerating throughout the 50s, when many, many, you know, very small scale research reactors 
were built on university campuses across the country. MIT was, is in, in that sense, MIT is unusual for, for having survived so long, not for having built when it was. And so I don't know what the longest, the, the, what the larger original plan was for you know, collection and containment of these um, unavoidable waste products. The, the Atomic Energy Commission, the kind of successor to the wartime Manhattan Project, really had a very, very kind of, at the time, it seemed very generous program to build these facilities, small scale facilities. I mean, just by the dozens and dozens across um, you know, liberal arts campuses, big research universities and sort of everything in between. And so I don't know what the plans were for that larger collection of stuff, let alone what we've been doing you know, very locally. Lucas, it looked like you were about to, to jump in as well. I cut you off, I think. Yeah, especially, I mean, by now it sort of fades into the background. We've all been used to, there's the basic knowledge that has been there seemingly forever, at least for, you know, for generations by now. There was, uh, so many of the folks, the, the TAs certainly will remember this. One time when Re Cambridge residents did have a reason to recognize these things was not an accident at the MIT reactor, thankfully, but at what had been a particle accelerator uh, closer to Harvard's campus, actually really contiguous with, with Harvard was at the time called the Cambridge Electron Accelerator, the CEA. And also one of these things, MIT also had one, the Atomic Energy Commission had also subsidized the construction of dozens and dozens of research accelerators, so particle accelerators, not just reactors. Uh, and the one in Cambridge, uh, close to Harvard, was one of that set. And in, I think it was 1965 or 66, mid 60s, uh, there was an explosion that actually killed a graduate student, did an enormous amount of damage uh, property damage as well as a loss of life uh, from the um, from the accelerator. So basically, a lot of the um, at the time, a lot of the detectors required cryogenic cooling, keep these things really cold, and that often required lots of kind of volatile gases under pressure. Uh, and so, uh, these so-called bubble chambers. And I believe it was a case. Of others on the call, Tiffany or, or Julie or others might remember better. Uh, Peter Gallus has written about this in one of his older books. So I think what happened with the CEA explosion was I think it was part of the cryogenic system that blew. It blew the roof off this factory-sized building. As I, I think at least one graduate student was killed in the explosion. I think only one loss of one person killed. Um, but that that's a wake-up call to the neighborhood in a big way. Like, wait, what that that little quiet, sleepy factory looking, a nondescript building, you know, practically con contiguous with Harvard's campus. They're doing what with what volatile materials? They could really do what? So there's certainly been moments in Cambridge's own, in our own Cambridge history, going back, you know, not super long ago, going that's, you know, 60, not quite 60, 55 years or so, where things, you know, ha where accidents happen, right? All these things are built, designed and built by humans. Uh, none of us, it turns out, is perfect. Uh, and uh, when you build lots and lots of these things in, you know, sometimes in pretty um, dense kind of quasi-urban settings, you know, that can be a bad recipe. Uh, now, it was nothing like the enormous accelerators that were built with much more careful shielding and site selection and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't like it was Fermilab or the Stanford accelerator, which was pushed far away from campus. This one was really, um, you know, uh, right, right near um, high, highly populated parts of Cambridge. So things like that have certainly have happened. Luckily, that, that did not, I don't think there was a concern about kind of radioactive waste being spread by that. I think that was a, a volatile set of chemicals that exploded um, and the damage was immediate, but not showering the immediate land with with things with isotopes that would be here for another uh, through the next ice age so in that sense it's not like a reactor meltdown but still you know da dangerous stuff uh, that really is <clears throat> every now and then unfortunately uh, you know d doesn't operate as 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 designed yes and and is that a different kind of is is the threat different today in a kind of um you know, Google Earth, everything's in principle under kind of some kind of camera surveillance. Anyone could map anything anywhere in principle. Is that different than when these things, when it took work to identify where these things even were? Uh, no one had automatic GPS coordinates, you know, downloadable. So I do think, I think the nature of that challenge um, has, has changed in the last, let's say, 20 years as well. Tiffany, you mentioned in the chat about Lake Anna in Virginia. I actually don't know about that one. Do you want, do you want to tell us about it? Yeah, I, I didn't realize, I, I've never been to the WIP facility. I, I have a number of colleagues from MIT who have been, because as again, as you may know, and I, maybe they mentioned in the 
film, that, that was a site for a bunch of underground um, kind of fundamental ex physics experiments as well. You want to be shielded from cosmic rays and lots and lots of physics experiments. I know this is on, on Julia's mind very directly. But for generations, lots of fundamental physics experiments have been in abandoned or, or no longer used mines because you want to get underground for various shielding reasons. So I have many, co several colleagues who have been at WIP regularly for like neutrino experiments or other kinds of um, particle physics things. Um, so they've been there. I've never, I've never been there, let alone driven past it going to or from Vegas. But Tiffany, your comment also reminds me something I, I, I didn't have a chance to really linger on in, in, uh, in the class material. But for, for, uh, uh, for many years when uh, nuclear weapons tests were still above ground, before they, before they went underground uh, with the uh, limited test ban treaty in the early 60s. These things were often <clears throat> pegged as tourist attractions. So obviously not to get too close to them, but in Vegas in particular, there was within sight lines of one of the continental testing grounds. Um, and so they would, the casinos and the hotels would actually sell, like advertise, they come this weekend because you'll get to see an explosion off on the horizon. It won't, you know, it won't be in your hotel room, but it'll be, you could have a clear view of this, you know, a, a temporary uh, display out the window. It was seen as um, as not just something to be tolerated or otherwise based on what seemed like Cold War realities, but really, I don't know if we'd say celebrated, but but seen as a kind of as a tourist attraction. I mean, that something that would help you sell hotel rooms and like you know come to Vegas this weekend kind of thing. I just find that chilling. I mean, it's just astonishing. Um, the, the way the way the in this case weapons not even reactors weapons were um, were seen in a kind of popular culture it wasn't <clears throat> so again coming back maybe to Lucas's point it's not only were they not trying to keep secret when the blast would be you think well are you worried about any kind of um, bad actors messing around with these with these nukes not only did they not worry about keeping the date and time secret they were actually advertising it as if they could almost sell tickets. Um, I, again, just the, our, atti our attitudes toward these things over the last uh, 50 or 60 years. I just find that stunning. Yes, I mean, maybe as, as you're saying to me, there, there is like, I don't know if we call it flourishing, but there is an actual like nuclear tourism, you know, maybe we can call it industry. One of my colleagues wrote a book, a very interesting book a few years ago, um, called The Nuclear Family Vacation, which is a pretty fun pun. She and her husband went traveling. So it was like a nuclear family that also went to all these nuclear family vacations. They went to visit nuclear sites actually around the world, including, I can't remember if they went to the Chernobyl site, but they certainly went to many places in uh, the former Soviet Union, as well as um, I think Eastern Europe and, and throughout the, the United States. Um, and she, and they wrote, she wrote, I can't remember if they co-wrote it together. They're both journalists, uh, excellent writers. Anyway, um, just say how many of these sites are accessible in general and what's the appeal to go to them, right? You wanna go see, like, like collect them all. Like I've seen this one and this one and this one, this one. Like, like other families might try to go to all the, you know, national parks and, you know, in some region of the country, they were gonna tick off all of these kind of uh, uh, nuclear related sites um, as a kind of, uh, you know, kind of, kind of tourism. Yeah, thank you. I, I agree, Deborah. I, I find that very hard to watch myself. I'm not an expert at all in <clears throat> the present day kind of bi biomedical hazards and what precautions are actually being taken. That um, so I, I don't know, but I, I like I think I mentioned briefly in a previous discussion. I know that there was a there was a, a very cavalier attitude toward these things uh, during the Second World War and in the early years afterwards, and often the cavalierness was not telling workers enough to inform them of risks that actually were otherwise well known by other experts, let alone the experts deciding to take their own risks or to, or to, or to <clears throat> you behave certain ways. Uh, and so I don't know what the, <clears throat> what the current, um, you know, training is like and so on, but uh, 3.6 rankings is not great, not terrible. I don't, I don't remember what, what what kind of exposure would 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 amount to three point six rankings? I don't remember the scales. You know what to expect. Do you do you remember? Or we can look it up. Right. Thank you. I I had, I had missed the reference. Very good. Yeah. Right. I agree as well as well. Randall, let's let's hawk all of Kate's books. <laughs> Excuse my colleague. Kate's most recent book. Um, oh shoot! What's the title? And that just came out roughly a year ago. 
there were a bunch, there was a kind of a, a collection of Chernobyl related books came out around the same time, one of which was, was, was Kate Brown. She's now, as you may know, Kate's a, a member of the MIT faculty. She moved here uh, roughly a year ago. Uh, the real expert on, uh, well, both on the Hanford site and the kind of longer term historical development of nuclear projects um, in the United States. She's also trained as a Russian and Soviet historian uh, an environmental historian. She's done a lot of original work on in uh, Russia, Ukraine, and and and, uh, and many many um, non English language sources, which I can't do. Uh, she she does marvelously. So she's really a remarkable scholar of kind of comparative views of uh, of a lot of these these materials. Yeah, I I don't know. I, um, and this does raise the other questions. I mean, this came up a lot during the debates over Yucca Mountain and, um, when it was still considered a live prospect is, you know, let's say you have sufficient geological stability that you can, you can somehow estimate for an unbelievably long time scale. And let's say you have enough sufficient storage and containment. How do you get the stuff there? I mean, do you put this on commercial railway, you know, cars coming back to, you know, Lucas's point before, if someone knows there's some bad stuff on that train, why don't you just knock out the train and have some horrible kind of dirty bomb type uh, attack? So how do you, how do you move the stuff, let alone in what form is the stuff kind of most stable and most easy to move? And uh, I, there are plenty of experts who study this full time. I'm absolutely not one of them. I don't know what the current best practices are, but I know these were the kinds of things that had to be thought through, not just can you predict the geological stability and the groundwater flow over you know, multiple millennia? I think the answer to that is not with sufficient confidence, right? That's already just incredibly uh, hard, just, just as, a, as a kind of narrow scientific question. And then you start getting to practical terms like, well, this stuff has to travel you know, 2,000, 3,000 miles, 2,000 miles. Um, how, do you, how do you get it there, right? What, do you, what happens along the way? Uh, and those were, let's just say, uh, as, again, as a in the physicist terminology, non-trivial, which is code for like, I have no idea. <laughs> it's really hard uh, and prone to all kinds of additional worries and concerns. Because even for the best intentioned humans, we're still human, you know, let alone any kind of nefarious things that could interrupt it. So I know those kinds of considerations have been live issues since the 70s or 80s, let alone in more recent times. But to Tiffany's more direct question, I actually have no idea how, how that set of, you know, kind of decisions were made. Is, it, is this format more stable to handle than others? Are that is well beyond anything I know about directly. There, some years ago, I mean, maybe 15 years ago by now, I've lost track. Again, a little off topic, but um, it was an, another historian of kind of Cold War nuclear age stuff who put a petition together because they were speaking about Hanford. There was a, a move to, let's see if I can get the story right. The local uh, Department of Energy um, administrators we're going to basically incinerate a bunch of, of literally garbage from mostly from World War II era or, or early post World War II times. Uh, and this other historian colleague of mine started a kind of petition to say, please don't burn that stuff. Historians can learn so much about what it was like to live on the site from you know the crumpled up cigarette wrappers. It, it wasn't like the, the, the kind of radioactive um, sludge. It was like signs of human encampments. It was like the what did the workers there what was their life like? And you know, you can learn a lot from going through someone else's garbage, right? So, so it was this effort to save the Hanford garbage, which sounds a little, you know, like tongue in cheek, but it was a real, it was a robust effort to say, we need to learn about what it was like uh, for, for all kinds of uh, laborers and other staff on the site. So please don't burn their old, their, their, at that point, you know, merely 50 year old or 60 year old garbage. And I actually don't know whatever happened. I, I don't remember the follow-up, whether that succeeded in, in, in saving the, uh, the historical garbage or not, but I found that an interesting effort. Think about the longest, earliest known kind of human stories that we still know anything about. And just to, to your point, they haven't been unchanging in interpreted meaning, imputed meaning, right? And that's over not even 10,000 years, maybe, maybe 5,000. Right, on the order of 5,000. I mean, who, we, don't, we don't teach you know, the ancient you know, uh, Greek stories to say this was their meaning, right? We teach them to say, look at the plethora of meanings that people might then or might still make of them. Or and think about you know, Talmudic commentary, we, we have any, any tradition, they're, 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 they're treated as kind of living interpretive traditions, often at least, precisely because the single unambiguous meaning is, is not what people seem to 
reach for or identify. And now multiply that by a factor of 30, right? Now do that not for 10,000 years, but for 300,000 years. I just find that just utterly mind boggling. Right? Um, so I, anyway, I share, I share your observation a lot of that. It is an interesting that that's what people, I take that maybe as a sign of, we might call it desperation, that we'll, they'll even go for that as opposed to any other, uh, like Tiffany's saying, kind of recognizably high tech, high modernist uh, interventions. When I think about, you know, I, I, can, I can't open documents that I wrote in college because of technological creep, right? I was actually using Microsoft Word because, you know, my, whereas my teachers weren't. So I, I, there was actually a level of continuity with my machines and my software, and yet I can't open documents from like the early uh, 90s. So talk about, think about that level of, of kind of just getting a, a, a message to persist and be, and be readable over again, ten, tens of years, not hundreds or, or hundreds of thousands. Right. Exactly. Yes. No. I think I, I totally agree. Uh, these, if, if not, if not literally invitations to dig, they're at least not very good at stopping people from digging. Maybe. Remember, our, our baseline since Chernobyl is, is approximately thirty years, thirty-three or thirty-four. Um, and again, I'm a little cautious making the leap from thirty years to three hundred thousand years. <laughs> so, so I guess you know. I don't know. Right. right, right. But also, I mean, I've seen some of these terracotta warriors. So clearly part of the site has been, has been not just you know, uh, investigated, but actually parts removed, right? Moved around the world. So uh, I don't remember the full details of it. Again, it wasn't like the entire site was left kind of untouched and pristine. Yeah, no, I, again, I, I take that as a sign of the kind of desperation, the nature of the challenge and the need to do sort of out of the box thinking, but I, I'm not sure that they found compelling answers <laughs> even with these wild exercises. So, yeah. And also like how many cults have survived for 300,000 years <laughs> or 10,000 years, right? Let alone just the, the mismatch in time scales. I just find utterly mind boggling. And, and, and it's a good example where I, I think it's safe to say that at each moment in those 2000 years, there hasn't been a single unified interpretation of what that body of practices and beliefs seems to mean. Uh, and that's a mere 2000 years, let alone longer. So. Or, or how many of the interpretations that even for people yeah. who do take it seriously, how many of them line up with the kind of uh, original intentions or the hoped for message back, back some generations ago. They're, they're, move, they're, you know, they're, they're interpretive moving targets. We're, we're people who make, who make meanings. Uh, so that means they, the meanings will change. You, you think it would be the, the pyramids all over again, in other words, right? So mm -hmm. build some, you know, kind of fairground type marker and that's just gonna draw, that could draw people in as opposed to tell them to stay away. Yeah. That, that might buy you a thousand years, you know, in round numbers, you know, Notre Dame or the Durham, uh, you know, I'm sure many structures in other parts of the world that I don't know about. You know, thousand years, pyramids, 4,000 years. We're still, <laughs> we're still missing some zeros right on that. Yes, unlike the Sphinx, of course, which nearby, which lost a nose to, you know, uh, overeager soldiers with, with machine guns. So, yeah. Any other parts? I mean, we're 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 focusing a lot on this three hundred thousand years time scale because I keep harping on it because I find it so mind boggling. Any other parts of the film? Other other themes or questions that it, that it, that are raised or brought to mind? Things that were unexpected. So that's a really interesting question. Alex. I don't know what we mean by safest or what the met what the metric would be. Um, so I, I do know we have you know, many colleagues at MIT who are very, very concerned about climate change. That's true broadly. And some subset of them are very concerned that if we're not trying to figure out um, kind of safe and reliable nuclear power, then is there a longer term viability to address climate change to get off of such a dominance of fossil fuels? I'm agnostic, I'm just personally to share, I, I just don't consider myself an expert enough on that to really understand the, the layers of trade-offs. But I know that there are plenty of our neighbors, I mean, at MIT, let alone in the wider world, who, who, 
who would answer your question in the affirmative, and I don't know enough to give it kind of thoroughly independent answer. I can I can understand at least where they're coming from. Um, and you know, and I think that the, the challenge then becomes, if that if that is the case, and I say if I don't know, how do we learn from the past to not keep replicating the unintended consequences that that have surrounded that body of work to date? And again, we're not talking about a thousand; you're talking about you know, fifty to seventy years. And the number of instances where, where safeguards weren't put in, where human error was, was nonetheless you know, not sufficiently guarded against, where you know, bad stuff happened even with the best of intentions, uh, then, then I think that, ra that, that makes other of my friends and colleagues concerned about saying, well, there's the answer. Let's just put all our eggs in that basket. Let's go charge right ahead. So I, I, I guess I sit astride a lot of these discussions and I genuinely, personally, genuinely just, just sort of, you know, stuck, just really stuck because I can really appreciate um, the impetus in, especially in terms of climate change and sustainability. And it also, you know, really share the worries that people who knew better in the past didn't always do better. People didn't always know better. What don't we even know today to even worry about, let alone what do we do know and still haven't adequately uh, really addressed in a systematic way. So I just feel, paralyzed, Pers I mean, personally, even though I know there are strongly held um, arguments on, on, a, on a whole range, it's not like it's one side versus the other, but a whole spectrum. Um, so I don't know, I mean, I don't know. If we had a, a, a flawless history for even five year stretches, let alone 50, then, I, then maybe I'd, I'd have more reason for confidence. But personally, I don't, I, I see, I see that the flaws and the unintended consequences pretty sharply, uh, per just personally from where I sit. Partly maybe because, you know, being a historian who focuses a lot on the Cold War and there are a lot of things that, that people did know better about back then and yet nonetheless, you know, citing national security, citing, you know, pressing demands or needs would kind of cut corners or not tell people the full uh, story and come out only later. So I guess I come to some of these things with a bit of a jaundiced eye, that's just me, um, personally. So that's where, that's where I, get, I get stuck. I will, I will just simply say I get stuck. I mean, it's, it's a great point, Lucas, and even stepping away from the nuclear side, I mean, again, you can find these very, you know, earnest debates about kind of, um, you know, cost benefit analyses and risk trade-offs about, let's say, ethanol. Let's get, you know, other, other efforts to, to focus on, say, fossil fuel use. Oh, we'll use, you know, bio-organic, this or that. And then you try to cost in all of the fossil fuel-based fertilizer that's needed or you know all the other things beyond the kind of the, the product narrowly construed and then you find that at the very least it becomes murky the answer becomes pretty unclear at least to me uh, and I think that is all the more so amidst these uncertainties like you know what do you do with all this nuclear waste that's not going to go away anytime soon when we come back to the question about about nuclear power so that doesn't mean the answer can never ever be nuclear power but I mean it just the the, the tendrils the extent of this very extensive system as opposed to like the safety protocols of a given reactor design. I think the, the, the breadth of those, uh, of, the, of the range of questions makes me um, skeptical that we're gonna find a, a clear answer, a clear metric that says, yeah, that says at the end of the day, yes, the green light. The answer is plus seven, you know, go forward. I, that's where I get more skeptical. And what are the competing incentive structures? Structures again. I'm not saying there's one clearly the right answer, but we have to worry about the uh, what decisions being made by according to, again to what measures or what metrics. What are the incentives? Yeah. I can't still be used. Oh, that's interesting. I again, others on the call might have a better answer, but I think. Um, the reactors that I'm familiar with are usually trying to do you know, very specific kinds of reactions to ultimately to extract uh, excess energy. Uh, and not everything that's radioactive will contribute to that energy balance. So things become radioactive as a consequence of, of these reactions can, from which one can extract energy. But I think the most um, well understood, and as far as I know, the most efficient reactions that will produce the excess energy ultimately uh, involve very specific kinds of ingredients, let's say, very specific kinds of target nuclei to start from. 
And so other stuff, that's why I think it's called waste. I and mean, the, the other things that become radioactive are not ones that one can nonetheless um, you know, put back into the reactor and extract uh, excess energy from in, in, any, in any scalable way. That was a very abstract answer. I'd have to learn more about the particular isotopes and particular reactions, which is not what I work on at all directly. But I, I think the basic point is that uh, for these fission reactions, you know, not everything's radioactive is, is highly fissionable, uh, and yet it still could be dangerous because it's still emitting junk that could hurt, you know, people and plants and the, and the, and the environment. Uh, I think that's the, that's the upshot. So only if a small set of these isotopes will actually um, fission upon being struck by neutrons of a certain characteristic and then release the excess energy. The others are shooting out alpha particles and, and beta rays and gammas, but, but not, um, not, not splitting a nucleus from which there'll be this large excess energy uh, per splitting, per fission event. So are these uh, uranium boosted um, armaments, these kinds of things? Yeah. I don't know Nixon's book, but I remember reading, reading at least some of the journalistic accounts about more recent concerns about uh, uses of um, uh, uranium doped armaments, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, we, we can pause there. We don't have to run down the clock. Uh, we cover a lot of ground already. Um, Thanks, thanks for joining the discussion. I thought that was really interesting. Um, we'll go back to the kind of regular format on Wednesday um, and thereafter, of course. Um, and then we'll go from there. If you have any other questions, of course, please don't hesitate to email me or any of the TAs. Um, I'll have my regular office hours Wednesday morning at 11 and all that good stuff. 